All right, hello everyone. So today I'm going to uh, have a video lecture over the second section uh, for chapter one here. Uh, it's uh, headed the three strategic themes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, to give you an idea, in your book, there's this sort of uh, diagram, right, with, it shows uh, the strategic themes, the integrative themes, and the goal being a sustainable future. Now, we'll talk about all these different parts, but just to give you a generic idea, um, strategic themes are sort of like ideas. Um, ideas, concepts are the basis of it. Integrative themes are sort of like the actions, like how that's actually put into uh, it, put into action and is executed. Okay, with the goal of being this sustainable future. So you can see like you, the strategic themes, the ideas, the concepts uh, lead to the action, the integrative themes. Okay, and then a combination of the strategic theme concepts and the integrative themes are what gets you to the goal of the sustainable future. All right. Um, now this first section deals mainly with the, the three strategic themes. Okay. So the, the three strategic themes are sustainability, stewardship, and science. Today we're going to talk about sustainability and stewardship. The first two. All right. Sustainability. Sustainability is actually one of the most important concepts in this whole, uh, be this whole semester. It's what most of environmental uh, science is based around. And it's the ultimate sort of measuring bar that, that you sort of test everything by and, and the ultimate goal, that sustainable future. Okay. What is sustainability? It's the ability to continue a process indefinitely. That means theoretically forever, without depleting or using up any of the natural resources required to keep it running. Right. A lot of people think that like environmentalism and sustainability and stuff means, uh, you know, this crazy notion of like going back to living as cavemen and stuff like that. And like you can't touch any in the environment. You got to leave everything alone and remove humans from everything. And that's, that's not true at all, really. Um, the, the concept of sustainability and a sustainable future is the idea that as humans, we rely on our natural environment to provide the things we need to survive. And the idea of sustainability is we want to use those things, those resources, in a way that we can continue to survive and thrive in the future. We don't want to uh, sort of mortgage our future for our actions in the present. We want to make sure we can continue and our, and our future generations can continue to live um, and, and thrive. And that's the idea of sustainability. It's not not using our environment, it's using it in a way that we ensure that we can continue to use it in the future. Right. Um, sort of, of one idea or one way to kind of look at this, there's a bunch of different ways, but one way that a lot of people sort of are familiar with, or at least understand is um, if even as a little kid, or if you've ever been fishing, okay, at a, at a place like you need to get a fishing license, right? And there are rules usually about the fish you can catch, how big they have to be, how many you can catch. And those rules are put into place in order to ensure that the fish population stays at a certain level so people can continue to fish in the future. You don't take fish that are really, really small because they haven't had a chance to grow and reproduce and, and replace them. Okay, you don't take um, too many fish because then you're going to put, uh, you know, lower the population to a, to a point where it might not be able to reproduce and continue to produce fish. So, so that's the idea is, is having sort of like rules and guidelines in place to ensure that we use things responsibly to make sure that it, they can continue to 
provide the resource for us in the future. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, I'll go back to stewardship and, and science later. Uh, we're going to focus on sustainability. So sustainability, uh, when uh, the goal being in sustainability is to get to a sustainable future, right? So we come up with uh, solutions for things that are problems or issues in our everyday worlds around us. Uh, those solutions, in order to be a truly uh, valid, sustainable solution, they have to have three parts. Okay, they need to be economically feasible, socially desirable, and ecologically viable. Um, in your book, it's got a, if, if you guys are familiar with this from English and other things called a Venn diagram, you've got the intersection of the three circles, the economically feasible, socially desirable, and ecologically viable. And where they all meet in the center, that would create a sustainable solution. You need all three parts. Okay, now we're going to explore a little bit why this is. Economically feasible. This means the solution needs to be financially sound, at the very least, not creating a money loss. Ideally, the solution would create a profit when implemented. So, um, you know, why is this? Well, the idea is money, money is sort of what runs everything in the world. Okay, money, money runs the world. And the question is why? Okay, now do people do things for other reasons other than money? Yeah, sure. But in general, money runs, you know, most of what people do in the world. Now, why is that? Well, at a very base level, the main goal of every person is to survive you know, reproduce somewhat like that's like a like genetic genetically, you know, um, but but basically to survive and thrive. OK, how do we survive? Well, we survive by getting the resources and the things we need for survival. What do we need for survival? Food, shelter, clothing, uh, you know, water, stuff like that. How do we get that stuff? Well, we get that stuff through money because money is the exchange system so in reality when we say money runs the world like people think oh it's so horrible like, well really money is just the exchange system what it what it really comes down to is just people trying to ensure that they have the resources they need for survival and to thrive okay so why does a sustainable solution need to be economically feasible well because economics are tied to the the how we uh, how we survive and thrive. And so if a solution doesn't, isn't economically feasible, then that actually takes away, uh, or degrades our ability to survive and thrive. Okay. Um, so let's use some, like, let's think of some like real life kind of concept with this. Uh, so recycling is a good one. people are much more likely to recycle if it's free, um, if it's easy, if it's easy and free. Um, they don't, people don't do it as much anymore, um, but there are still some people who do this. Like, And I think in town there used to be, I don't know if it still is, I know several years ago, they used to have like this little like machine where you could recycle aluminum cans and stuff. You know, why would people recycle aluminum cans? Or why would people collect aluminum cans and bags and take them to a recycling place? Well, they would do it because they got paid for it. You could actually, people would pay you money to turn in aluminum. So then people saw a benefit from it. Okay, if it doesn't benefit them, uh, to some extent, they're not going to do it. And it, they and they for sure won't do it if it, if it costs them money. Um, Another example of this is uh, like energy efficient electric cars. The technology to do like electric cars and energy efficient cars and stuff like that has been around for decades. But why hasn't it been, why wasn't it put into uh, actual practice before really like, uh, you know, 2010-ish, somewhere in there? 
Well, the simple answer is, is it wasn't economically feasible. Gasoline is super cheap, comparatively. Gasoline is super cheap, and so there was no reason to change until 2006, 2007, 2008, when the housing market crashed. When the housing market crashed and we went into that recession, um, gas prices shot up. Some, at some point, gas prices were over $4 a gallon. Well, guess what? When people are driving 45 minutes to an hour to their jobs a day, that really makes a big impact on their wallet. So the demand for more um, energy efficient and alternate, uh, I guess, alternate fuel in a way, sources rose. It spiked highly. People didn't want to be driving the, you know, Yukon Denali and uh, all these other vehicles. Uh, you know, they're getting whatever 12 miles per gallon. They don't want to be driving them an, an hour to work every day. It's costing a lot of money. So the demand spiked because it made economic sense and it helped people. So the solution needs to be financially sound, at the very least, not creating a money loss. Okay, there are very few people who recycle. I live in Rochelle. There are very few people who recycle by me. The main reason is, is because there is no recycling option that you don't have to pay for. I had to actually search between three different companies to find a company that even did recycling out there. And when I did, it's costing me like an extra, uh, I think it's costing me an extra 10 bucks a month to have a recycling bin and have them come out to do recycling, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you only pay $30 a month anyway, like paying 40 instead of 30 is a significant difference. Most people don't do that because they have to pay extra to do something where they can just throw it all in the trash anyway and pay 30 to pay less for it. So that's not a very good sustainable solution because it doesn't meet that criteria. Okay. Socially desirable. People have to want it and it has to be acceptable to a majority of the society. Now this seems kind of like, I don't know, almost like really basic, like, okay, people have to want it. What, like, why, like, what does that mean? Um, it has to be acceptable and people have to want it. The main reason is because if people don't agree with it or a majority of people don't want it, the rules won't be followed then. Okay. So, uh, take for example, we all know that they've, I know they've relaxed it in the past, like five to 10 years or so, but like China had the one child policy, right? Everybody's really pretty familiar with that. Um, a method of population control where people were essentially only allowed one child and and if they had more than one child they were um there were pretty severe financial penalties and stuff like that um their society lived by that rule for a long time it was acceptable in their society now imagine they wanted to institute a one child policy in the united states do you think that would ever would that fly? Not in your life. Okay. I mean, you're all probably kind of laughing right now because it's, it's obvious. Like there is no way that people in this, in, in our country would stand for that. It's, it's, uh, our right to have children is seen as one of our sort of like inalienable rights. Like you can't take that away from somebody and, and to, um, sort of, take that away or limit that would be seen as a, as a extremely unacceptable uh, thing in our society. So it wouldn't be acceptable. It would never work. That would never be accepted. Even if, even as, as a concept, it would be maybe a way to, to do something about a certain problem, you know, population control or whatever, but it would never, ever work. People wouldn't fight it. People would rebel against it. They would never accept it. So that, that makes it not a, not a valid sustainable solution. Okay. People have to accept it in general. Now it doesn't mean they have to like it. People don't have to love it, but they have to at least accept it as being a reasonable rule or restriction or law or something to follow. Okay. Um, the third one, ecologically viable. Ecologically viable means it needs to be environmentally friendly and able to be reasonably done. Okay. What does that mean? Well, it means you have to 
uh, you have to consider all the environmental impacts and it can be it can be tough sometimes um, you know to really determine so uh, for example uh, just on a very sort of generic basis um, if you if somebody wanted to build a dam to uh, increase the, the capacity for hydroelectric power. Okay. Well, that might be a solution for a cleaner energy, like producing cleaner energy. But building the dam is going to dam up the river and create a lake behind it. It's going to displace and, and it can actually change entire ecosystems. So even though it's, it might be a solution to one, pro, one problem, like, in a, like an energy problem, it might create a bunch of other environmental problems. So it needs to be like environmentally friendly in general. Now, is everything going to be perfect solution? No, but the environmental impact of it needs to be very, like really minimized. And it needs to, to solve uh, more problems than it, than it creates. Okay. And able to be reasonably done. Okay. It can't be something that, that as a solution really isn't um, feasible. For example, the, the problem of, of plastic in the ocean. Plastic in the ocean is a huge problem, um, and trying to come up with ways to, to, to remove plastic from the ocean is a very daunting task. Um, can you, could, could you pick plastic out of the ocean and filter and strain plastic? Yeah, you can. Is that able to be reasonably done? No. And I'm not talking about large, large pieces of plastic. I'm talking about um, what's called like the microplastic, like plastic breaks it, it breaks down in fractures, but it doesn't actually biodegrade in water. So in other words, what you basically get are, think about, um, think about rocks like eventually like wearing and breaking down into sand. Okay, so they're not degrading, they're just breaking into smaller and smaller pieces. That's kind of what plastic does in the ocean. Like it doesn't degrade, it just breaks into smaller and smaller pieces. You can't filter it out because um, it's so small that it, uh, that any kind of filter you would have would, would pick up all kinds of other um, biological life, you know, fish, plant life, and all this stuff, and pull all that out too. So it's not a, it's not a valid, uh, it's not something that's able to be reasonably done. Okay, now you can't just pick it out by hand. That doesn't work either. There's just way too much of it. So it has to be a solution that's able to be reasonably done. Okay, you have to have all three parts of these to have a valid, sustainable solution. Which is why coming up with sustainable solutions is not always easy. It's, it's possible, but not always easy. Okay. All right. So how do we get uh, on the path to a sustainable future in our society or, or as a globe, as a global, um, as a global species? Okay. Um, there are what they call five essential transitions. In other words, changes that need to occur to get us to a sustainable future. Now remember, they're not talking about just the United States. This is a global issue, okay? Yes, we can apply them in, con in theory and, and idea to the United States, but they're talking about really a, a global issue here, okay? So the first transition is a demographic transition from a continually increasing human population to one that is stable. So essentially to slow to stop population growth because it's putting it, it 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 eventually is going it already is straining the global resources of the ability of the globe to provide enough food and shelter and water for people okay second transition is a resource transition this is we need to change from the current sort of like production and materialistic uh like usage, like throwaway type stuff, change to an economy, economy that relies on nature's income and protects ecosystem capital from depletion. Now, what's ecosystem capital? Ecosystem capital is the sum total value, it's like the added total value of all the naturally occurring resources in an area. Okay. Um, so, that includes, um, you know, that includes things like uh, the things that you would normally think about, like uh, like resources, 
such as um, wood, like if you log wood for paper, for houses, for lumber, whatever, stuff like that. Or if you think about, um, you know, mining for metals or stuff like that, uh, um, you know, those, those are the typically things we think of resources. But there's also another part of ecosystem capital that is like, um, that's like usage of the land. So, um, for example, if a place has a lake and um, they have like water sports like uh, jet skis and water skiing and people to use the lake and they've got campsites around it and stuff, all the income that comes from like licensing and, uh, you know, people paying to use the lake and to do things and all kind of stuff, the income from that is also income based on the environment. That's part of the total ecosystem capital. It's the, tum, the sum total value of all the naturally occurring resources in an area. Okay. All right. Third essential transition, technology. We need to change from a pollution intensive, producing large, in other words, producing large amounts of pollution, economic production to an environmentally benign, the term benign means friendly or non-harmful processes. So we need to convert um, the, you know, the, the industrial revolution and the, and the manufacturing revolution led to a, a huge spike in the production of goods, but they weren't really concerned with how it occurred and the impacts on our environment in, in doing that. It was, it was essentially just how can we produce more product faster and more efficiently with like, with no real regard for the impact on, uh, the environment. Well, we need to we need to now change from from this more faster, more efficient mindset to a mindset that that the the processes that we do are environmentally friendly and not harming the environment. Okay, no, it doesn't mean that we make it like okay, everything needs to go back to being handmade. No, it means we need to adapt and come up with better techniques that are not harmful on the environment. Okay, all right. Fourth one, political sociological transition. We need to change to societies that embrace a stewardly and just approach. We'll talk about that a little bit here in, in a bit to people's needs and in which large scale poverty is eliminated. And we'll talk much more about this, but essentially we do need to, to become a society that cares about our environment and our resources and, and how we use it. That needs to be a big, important part of our society and our political um, mindset. It's important. Um, and then number five, a community transition. We need to, to uh, transition from the present car dominated urban sprawl to smart growth concepts of smaller functional communities and more livable cities. Uh, so the idea of, um, you know, sort of having our cities be, our, our communities be more functional. You see this with like farmer's markets and, you know, in smaller, more community-based businesses and stuff like that. So people don't have to travel, um, you know, great distances in order to buy the things that they need. Um, so, and again, we will, we'll break that down a little more in the future, but so those are the five transitions that will help so these are transitions that that help lead to a sustainable future. Okay. All right. So that all falls under the umbrella of sustainability. Okay. Now, if you uh, need to take a little break, you can pause it or whatever. I know this is gonna be a, a long lecture. Uh, so that covers the sustainability part of the three strategic themes. We are also today gonna to cover the stewardship uh, section as well in this lecture, all right? Okay, welcome back if you paused it. If not, here we go. Stewardship. <clears throat> uh, what is, oh, sorry, what is stewardship? Well, stewardship is the ethical and moral framework that should educate our public and private actions. So 
if we think about it, like, what is a, what's a, what's a framework? Okay. Well, it's, it's sort of like a, a blueprint or, or a, a series of, of rules and ideas, right. That are set up. So like, for example, in our, in our country, we have a legal framework. What's our legal framework? Well, the legal framework is a set of, of, uh, you know, rules and laws and codes that, that we've decided we want to follow to, um, within our society to make our society function well. Okay. So a stewardship framework is essentially an ethical and moral framework. So if we think about it, we all have our, we all have an ethical and a moral framework. Um, we have our own personal one things, you know, stuff that we personally believe is, is, is right and wrong. Okay. We have, you, we might have, you might have a religious framework, uh, a religious, you know, ethical and moral framework. That's part of your, uh, makeup, right? You, um, you know, we have, we, we probably part of our legal, what we, what we view as legally ethical and moral. And then, um, you know, and then it's, it's, and it's, and all of these things kind of come together to form, you know, our own personal ethical and moral framework. Now we need to have a societal ethical and moral framework. We need to have, uh, things that we say are, are not allowed. And a lot of times we do, um, turn those into part of our legal framework saying that this is not acceptable. Okay. Um, so the stewardship should be the ethical and moral framework that should educate. In other words, sort of like, uh, be the background to our public and private actions. Okay. So this can go everything from as simple as like, um, not throwing out trash out of your car, not littering. Okay. To, um, things like, uh, endangered species acts that, that, uh, that we've enacted. Okay. To, um, to, uh, political, tr uh, agreements with other countries and, and packs about pollution. Uh, all kinds of different things like, uh, but, but our ethical and moral framework are the basis for how we decide what we are going to create laws and rules about and what we're going to say is acceptable and is unacceptable and what we should value. Value is a good word. It's ethical and moral framework decides what we should value. What do you value in your life? What do you, what do we value as a society? And our stewardship needs to in, uh, uh, environmental stewardship needs to uh, create a value for environmental uh, issues and sustainability. Okay. Um, so what are some parts of the stewardship? I think, well, uh, I'm going to kind of jump down here and we'll go back up to that. Stewardship ethic is based on uh, four main ingredients, cases, moral rules, moral principles, and bases. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to do these in reverse because it kind of works up. So the basis, bases, plural basis, um, ethical principles are justified by reference to some philosophical or theological basis. It's the foundation for an ethical system. So some sort of philosophical or theological, uh, you know, bases, are what are what everything is built upon. These create ethical and more or moral principles. It's the foundation for them. Moral principles are the broadest ethical concepts considered to be valid in all cases. These are created using the ethical bases. So these are our uh, broadest ethical concept. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of, of examples. Um, like, so, so I guess in the United States, you talk about like the, um, you know, the concepts of, 
of freedom and, and life and liberty, right? Um, now, remember, these, these principles, it's, as with a lot of these things, it's not an unrestricted thing. It's, you know, these ethical concepts um, apply to all people. So your right is not necessary is not any more important than than another person's right and your rights should not infringe on upon other people's rights um so the moral principles these broad ethical concepts are what moral rules are based upon moral rules are general guidelines that can be applied to various areas of concern so these would be like uh, you know, basically like laws and stuff like that. They're not always laws, but like laws would be an example of more of some moral rules. Okay. Um, applied to various areas of concern. Okay. I think in the book they give, let me see if I can find this really quickly. Um, It says, uh, such as the rules that govern how we should treat endangered species. So that would be, that would be a, that fall, that would fall under the level of a moral rule. Okay. Then the sort of most specific is cases, specific cases, deals with whether specific acts are morally justifiable. These are based on moral rules. Okay. Um, so talk about, uh, murder or, or I should say killing someone, okay, one person killing another person. Well, we've got general guidelines, right? But the case, case by case is dependent upon whether it's morally justifiable or not. People can, somebody can kill another person in self-defense. And we find that that's morally, excuse me, that that's morally justifiable. Somebody goes out and, and kidnaps, rapes, and tortures somebody. That would not be more morally justifiable based on our moral rules and principles. Okay. So cases, individual acts. All a stewardship ethic. Now, if we sort of uh, focus that idea on environmental stewardship, this is how you create an environmental stewardship ethic. The same way we create a legal, uh, legal ethic and all that other stuff. Okay. All right. Now, how is this sort of applied or like in what, in, or what are some kind of ideas? So we talked about things like, things like, um, uh, environmental or not, I'm sorry, uh, endangered species. Okay. Endangered species acts, uh, park, uh, like national park funding and stuff like that. Like that's based on our stewardship ethic. Um, laws that we make about pollution would be based on stewardship ethic. How, uh, another one, justice and equity. Justice and equity are a really important part of stewardship. Okay. Um, justice and equity, the, the goal, okay, the goal of public environmental policy is to promote the common good. In other words, we look at something and it it's we want to promote what is good for all people. Or you know, at, at least in general, what's fair and, and just and, and right and good for all people. Okay. Um, under justice and, and equity, we have something, a uh, definition of something called environmental racism. Environmental race, racism is the placement of waste sites and other hazardous industries in towns and neighborhoods in which most of the residents are non-white or minority. This is usually in economically depressed areas. Okay, now, why does this occur? Okay, it doesn't occur because people are like, oh man, we hate minorities. Let's go put, you know, let's go put this trash dump right in the middle of a minority place because you know, we're all racist and hate minorities. No, like that's, it's not, 
is not how it occurs. Um, it's and and actually in a way, it's almost more difficult to 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 combat against because because something like that if that actually occurred that'd be easy people would be like you know you can, you can call out racism when you see it blatant like that all right um, this is is sort of more like a little more subversive it's 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 harder to to sort of um, identify and and really sort of kind of uh, identify when it's occurring so what usually happens so think about this like waste sites and other hazardous industries who wants those in their neighborhood near where they're living near their schools near their businesses nobody okay nobody wants those things anywhere near so why do they normally get placed in minority non-white areas the key to this is right here usually in economically depressed areas okay imagine for instance trying to put a uh, a landfill in the middle of naperville okay would that ever happen heck no because you would stir the wrath and anger of the naperville soccer moms soccer moms unite right and they would rise up against it not in my precious babies not near my where my precious baby lives and goes to school Right? They all worked up and they would form a coalition and they'd work day and night to, to prevent it, right? Well, how do you prevent something like that? Well, different factors. You have time, you have money, you have uh, power in terms of like um, the power of, of getting people to, to listen to you and to want, you know, to, to sort of want to take up your cause. Okay. Um, and so they have the means to fight against it. They're going to contact their local politicians. They're going to contact their, you know, state politicians. They're going to fight back against it. They're going to spend time, um, you know, uh, talking to news programs and getting the, and getting the word out there and, and doing pamphlets and flyers and showing up at showing up at political meetings at, at a, you know, um, town hall, like town meetings and all this kind of stuff. They've got the money to put behind it. Why are, why are local politicians and, and state politicians maybe going to listen to them? Well, because those are the people that help fund their reelection campaigns. And those are the people that help get them reelected. So they're going to listen to them. Okay. That's why those don't get put in those areas is because those people know they have the means and they know how to fight back. Think about the poor minority economically depressed areas. Those people don't have time to do that. They probably don't know how, even if they did know how to do it and who to contact, are they going to be listened to? Probably not as much. They don't have the, the financial backing to, to make an impact on the, on maybe as many local politicians. Okay. What do they, they, you know, they're probably working in families, maybe, my, maybe, um, you know, a lot more single, single parent families, that parent has to work. They can't spend time, um, you know, with activist causes or stuff like that, or even in, you know, even if they're economically depressed areas, even if they've got a, a nuclear family, you know, two, two parents or more work. They, a lot of times they both have to work in order to make ends meet. They don't have time to be running around, you know, marching and protesting. And, um, I mean, I guess I mean that in terms of like, uh, extended pits of time to like build up, uh, campaigns, I guess the, the campaigns that effectively get things changed. Um, they don't have the, the knowledge, they don't have the political pull, all this stuff. So what happens is the fight back against these waste sites and industries being placed in those areas isn't effective. So these places can come in and they're, and they're not fought against so they can, they can actually be put into those areas. So tying this all back into stewardship is we need to create a stewardship that is to promote the common good. Okay. We want to promote the common good, not, not just the people who have the means and the economic ability to fight back against it. 
Okay, we should we should make it fair and equitable for all members of our society. And so trying to eliminate things such as environmental racism racism is important in uh, our environmental stewardship ethic. Okay. All right. Thanks for hanging with me, guys. Uh, the science portion of this will be in tomorrow's uh, lecture. So thanks for uh, hanging with me throughout this uh, long lecture. And if you have any questions, like usual, you can uh, send me a remind text, send me messages through classroom, email me, whatever. If you have any questions or even if you have like, you know, you're welcome to you know, have discussions, you can always pop into during our uh, office hours on Tuesday and Thursday. Even if you don't have questions, if you just want to discuss stuff or something popped into your head about it and you want to talk to me about it, you're more than welcome to pop in and, and discuss stuff. Um, uh, I would enjoy that. All right. All right. I will talk to you guys later.